Hi, welcome to another episode of Start the Week with Wisdom. I'm your host, Bridget Burns, CEO of the University Innovation Alliance. And I'm your co-pilot, Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed. Each, uh, well, every usually every week, but now lately we're taking a, we're doing a slow we're doing a slow play for the summer. Um, Doug and I team up to have a conversation with a sitting college president or chancellor to try and distill their a perspective about them and their leadership and their wisdom because we always hear stuff about individual uh, universities and about topics in our sector, but we actually want to talk about the leader and we want to know how what they've learned about leadership how they've learned it and hopefully this will be inspiring and give you something to chew on that's positive and uplifting on a monday so that's why we call it start the week with wisdom uh and this week we're joined by a pretty familiar name in higher education um paul leblanc who's uh, president of southern new hampshire university um had been president of uh uh uh, Marble College before that, um, and uh, but he's been president of Southern New Hampshire. You're going to hit 20 years pretty soon. Welcome, Paul. Hey, it's great to be with you. Two of my favorite people in higher ed. It'll be 20 wow. years next uh, summer, Doug. Wow. I hope you have a big planned uh, party. I just saw Michael Crow had his 20 year just come up too, and it's like you are rarefied air. Um, but the part that I wanted to flag is that most people probably didn't know what were you up to before this? Um, we we hear you talk about Southern New Hampshire. We know what fantastic work you're doing, but uh, the fact that you were already a college president, I find super interesting that I didn't know. Um, mm. And I just wanted to start there in terms of, um, I want to know what you were up to before. <laughs> before yeah, Harris. well, you know, I started as a faculty member, but I was a grad student at UMass Amherst when PCs arrived and the first local area networks, like the first browsers, oh my God, this is going to, this would be like your grandfather talking about his first you know, Model T, but we were you now talking, we were using Mosaic as a browser and it was Lotus was our sort of email of choice and, and, and browsing was new. So anyway, uh, I was uh, writing composition for TA at UMass and uh, Ken Olson, the famous CEO of, of uh, Digital Equipment Corp, I uh, was very late to the idea of personal computers and they made a run at it with something called the Deck Rainbow. That was their first PC. It was a huge flop. So they dumped all these computers on UMass because he was on the board at the time. The full-time faculty said, not in your life. We're not touching this stuff. So they said, turned to the most unempowered people on campus and said, hey, UTAs, you got to use this in your writing classes. And it was my first, like, what? No instruction. No, you know, like, we were early days of word processing. But I just was blown away by the possibilities. Um, remember, you know, in this local area network, being able to remove students' login names and then be able to do some things with that. And I taught a cat class on gay and lesbian literature and film at the request of some of our gay students. And it was a very different era. I had no business to teaching that course, but they asked me to. And I remember the conversations were so awkward and weird because some kids were out, some weren't straight kids. Like, so we put them in this LAN and this network lab and took away their login names. And all of a sudden the conversation just blew open. Like people could ask things like kids who had never been able to talk about their sexual, sexual orientation were doing so for the first time. And then I saw the way that the regular face-to-face class got better as well. So I just like, wait a minute, there's something here. So I, I jumped into technology at a time when it was really still so new. Um, I was the first doctoral student at UMass to um, have a programming language as one of my two foreign language requirements. And uh, later on, I went back at this little award, alumni award, and the now retired department chair said, you know, Paul, you were the first person to have programming as a language, part of the PhD program. And after you left, we thought you would damn well be the last. Um, but anyway, went on to do work in that area. I did three years uh, leave of absence from my first academic job at Springfield College to head up a technology startup at Houghton Mifflin when all the publishers were rushing to get in because Wall Street Journal in 1992 said they were all dinosaurs and they were gonna die in the world of new media. So they were trying to figure it out, did that for three years. And then after that was heading back because I knew I wanted to be on a campus and was nominated for the presidency at Marlboro College, this quirky little liberal arts college in Southern Vermont. And I thought, no way, never gonna hire me, I'm 37 years old, way too young, don't, don't have any sort of, you know, um, no call on such a job, but I went anyway because I thought it'd be a great experience. And I was the last interview of the day after two days of interviews. And I had just flown back from Apple. I've been doing this work with Apple as a, a, on an ARPA grant. And I thought, you know, these guys are going to be like sugar loaves at this point. So I brought 
fresh baked cookies at a bakery that was near the, the interview site. And they later told me, they said, you know, we didn't know if you'd get the job, but we knew you'd be a finalist because you brought cookies that day and we needed them badly. So, so I accidentally fell into a presidency and I learned so much. School. Yeah. And then I did that for seven years and learned a lot. And the beauty of being a president at a really little school is you have to wear all the hats. Like on my first week, we got a notice that our septic system was failing and the state was threatening to close its down. I was like, what? So the first million dollars I've ever raised in my life was to replace the septic system. I thought, I have a scheme. You could give us a million bucks and you could name it after your worst enemy, like the, you know, the so-and-so septic field. Um, that that wasn't required, but we did raise the money and it was an amazing experience. And that and then was SNE2, uh, almost 20 years ago, as I said. So, so when yeah. when you, at, at two private independent colleges, neither of them very wealthy, um, what did, when did your, when did you decide how early in, in that, in your first presidency and then in the transition to Southern New Hampshire, did you decide that technology was going to need to be more of a factor than it had pre presumably been in those institutions lives previously? And what, what, what spurred that? Yeah, well, but, you know, I have been working in the space. And of course, remember, this is, you know, I took that presidency in 1996. So it was the explosion, right? This was the dot com boom. And I could sort of see the environment of American higher education. Saw, you know, you can do the demographics. Marlboro was isolated, it was really small. Um, it was struggling financially. Who gets first presidencies? People who go into small, struggling institutions, right? So, uh, and I was, I was, passionate about technology. So we, um, I was able to persuade the board and the faculty and, and my colleagues to open up a new graduate center. They'd never done graduate education. And I, at that time, had got to be good friends with Clay Christensen. And so I took it right out of his playbook. Let's do it away from campus. Let's do it, you know, 20 minutes away down in Brattleboro. Let's open up something called the Marlboro College Grad Center. And we did the first full degree program in e-commerce. And we did the first Masters of Arts in Teaching with Internet with the internet. We called it that, with the internet, which is a funny thought at, the, at now. Um, and we did low residency, you know, one, you know, working online you know, once a month coming to Brattleboro. And that really opened our catchment area. And it really became a source of new revenues and strength in the school and kind of left on a good, in a good place. Um, I couldn't get them to do fully virtual degrees. And I thought, this is the next step. Like we could be a market leader in this. That was a bridge too far. Like there was such like they could only push them so far. And, and that was not a failure of their imagination. That was a failure of my ability to do a convincing narrative that would persuade them to go that far. Um, so that was that's when we started doing it, Doug. And then, of course, when we saw um, the growth of online learning, we saw the for-profits rush into the vacuum because most not-for-profits were looking down their nose at it. I thought, no, we are seeding this important part of serving Americans. Um, how can we do that? So SNHG was a great place to to sort of take that next step. Um, I think that's just, this whole story is so interesting. Uh, mainly, I think I find it so interesting, again, that I did not know any of these things about you. Okay. Um, that I think a lot of folks, this is going to be the first time they've heard these stories. And I, I just, I think, especially that story about um, how technology um, enabled a level of candor and trust in that class you taught um, is really, you know, it's, it's interesting that you're talking about something more than 20 years ago, and yet that is actually still something that we're trying to infuse and we're trying to get the right balance on. Um, I'm curious about Clayton Christensen um, because most folks know that he played a critical role at, on like with your board and with uh, advising Southern New Hampshire, but I am curious, I don't know if Southern New Hampshire was a likely candidate to have Clayton Christensen involved, and so I wanna know how you met him and uh, I want like what your relationship was like and, and kind of what you learned from him that might be surprising to folks. Yeah, so Clay and I met long before he was famous. I tell him all the time, I, I knew you and no one knew you. So like, don't get too right. But of course, Clay was the most modest of people. Um, and we met playing basketball in a church gym in Cambridge, Mass on Saturday mornings when I was still in graduate school at Boston College. So not even in my doctoral program at the time. And Clay was the head of a ceramics, a high-tech ceramics firm, long before he went to Harvard and went back to graduate school. Um, interestingly, we were having these very early conversations about the impact of technology, because again, he was in this whole reinventing ceramics through new technologies. Um, and I was doing a lot of work with computers again at the time. So we started a conversation. And back in the 90s, I was trying to find it 
and I, I can get my hands on it, but we did a column for one of the higher ed trade publications. It wasn't inside higher ed at the time, Doug, um, talking about a lot of things that became part of the conversation much later. Now, rudimentary kind of frameworks of theory around disruptive innovation, how that could happen. So it was a lifelong conversation. Clay was a dear friend of 40 years and still miss him. He passed away, as you know, a couple of years ago. Um, but he was on our board for nine years and was tree of trustee emeritus. And I often say things that I get credit for really are really just the implementation of his playbook. But SNHG became a favorite case study for him in terms of higher ed and using the theory. And, and, and some of it, you know, everyone uses the phrase disruptive innovation or sustaining innovation. But, but if you go deeper, there's actually very practical things one needs to do depending on what kind of innovation you're implementing. And, and, and you can sort of game plan it in a way that I don't hear people talk enough about because Clay was very thoughtful about that. Um, one of the greatest teachers I've ever met, um, still drove the beat up Honda Accord that he had before he was famous, still lived in the first house in Belmont, Mass, that he moved into as a young faculty member. Um, also, you may know that Clay was a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, so he was a Mormon. And I was a huge Boston sports fan. I grew up in the Boston area after we immigrated from Canada when I was a little kid. And um, and Clay knew all, there was, a, there was a wealth of Mormon athletes in Boston at the time. Bruce Hurst was pitching for the Red Sox. Danny Ainge, who later on became the general manager, was a player. Um, Greg Kite was a cousin of, so, so I got to sort of revel in this sort of small circle of my heroes, which was great fun. Another thing I loved about Clay, he was very generous in sharing that network. Do, do, what's your sense of how his theories how neatly his theories applied to higher education and and why higher education um i don't know continues in certain ways to um i don't know i don't know that it's a exempt from it or an outlier from it but it's it, it, i guess i'm curious sort of how you think that yeah. intersection clay and i talked a lot about this so two things i think that probably he would have gotten to with more time in his life and more time in his research because he's always moving to the next like interesting question is great curious mind and great learner. One was I think Clay underestimated the challenges in a regulated industry. So his ideas of disruptive innovation were really played out in the kind of open market for-profit corporate world. But when you look at um, the changes he was thinking about in healthcare, they actually are playing out largely as he described, though more slowly. And I would say that a lot of what he describes for higher ed, and of course he's been beaten up with this, you know, 50% of all schools will go out of business. But the reality is a lot of that will take slower because colleges are hard to kill. Um, and they will go on sort of as zombie institutions in some, inst in some instances are really flailing and struggling, but they're very hard to sort of, they, they don't go to business easily. That may change real soon <laughs> with the end of perf money and a lot of small colleges I think are struggling as you know, better than me, Doug. So, so I think he underestimated the impact of a regulated industry, a highly regulated industry. And the second thing I would say, Clay um, didn't have time to really go as far on the people slash culture piece of what it means for these organizations to change. And so if you look at his work, it's, it's amazing. And I think it just sort of changed our society in many ways, at least in the business, uh, the world of business. But it's an area that I think he didn't have enough time to really get to. He, he did it in a personal way, probably one of his most widely read books is that how, how, how I Measure My Life, right? That, which is a, based on a famous lecture he did. So I think that's what he underestimated in our world, Doug. That makes sense. I, I think that um, related to what you're talking about, uh, I'm getting a feedback, um, is, you know, we might be judging this prematurely, but I think that the piece that has been missing in higher ed is we need to model how to close an institution without demoralizing the people who have committed their lives to it. Yeah. We still need, uh, we have a model in the academy uh, for honoring the past, which is emeritus status. And we need to figure out how to gracefully transition an institution to emeritus or a program, this is at, at every level, we have to learn how to stop doing things. And yeah. I feel like that's a, that's not a new observation in higher ed, but the piece it, that we need is modeling how to stop well and how to do it in a way with that, that doesn't cause harm and acknowledges the past. Um, and that will make it so that you'll see far more. But right now we're still in a place where 
um, you know, there's almost like a, a dog whistle around the alma mater status. And like, you know, you get folks to come back in from the trenches to fight, but they aren't really going to show up for that institution time and time again. Um, and so we're kind of in, I think in that stage in, in that we actually have to figure out how to close um, and, and how to shut things down in a way that doesn't, um, doesn't devastate people. And then you, and then you might, he might be right. Yeah, and the school that I first led, Marble College, it closed just a couple of years ago and was subsumed under Emerson. And I watched it painfully. And it's, I've thought so often about the fact that part of Marlboro's scrappy, defy all reality existence for decades was this sort of dedication to its mission and how it did what it did. But there is a point where that act, that strength that carried you through such difficult times actually becomes your Achilles heel and your weakness. And I think that's what happened. I think that they just couldn't let go of the model. And honestly, there are folks in those institutions who would rather see it closed than evolve. Um, and, and that's also part of the culture piece that's irrational, but but it is part of the equation that I think they didn't account for. I am excited, Bridget. I think so many small schools, when they get acquired, they're essentially disappear. They, you know, their name goes on as an institute or something else, but they disappear. And we are working on a really interesting, innovative model to look at, and it's based on a deep study of platform cooperatives. Could we build the platform that would allow small institutions to leverage economies of scale so they don't have to build their own tech platform, their own security, their own HR, et cetera. So we're prototyping the first of those very soon. Um, I'm super excited about it. It's We're moving through the regulatory process and it challenges them because it's not, it's not full autonomy, but nor is it acquisition. So it sits on a new middle ground we're trying to forge. That's cool. I mean, I, I do think there are a lot more examples in, that only just now have happened that are we're going to see a greater proliferation. So for instance, yeah. thinking about what happened in Pennsylvania, no one thought was actually possible, right? There there are examples of things that that felt like they were intractable and, you know, that was going to be a hill to die on. And yet there are little examples, little points of light. And I think you're going to see more examination of those things. And it's, it's only going to spread now that it's been proven that what was supposed to not be done or be impossible has actually happened. Um, so that's, yeah. Um, anyway, but good actually, news for people who are yeah. for closing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, except, yeah, well, and actually, that's the thing. I, I, we're going to be publishing our survey of business officers on Wednesday, and lots of a lack, real lack of interest in merger for a lot of the reasons you, you just yep. cited, Paul. But uh, basically, half of business officers open to the idea of sharing administrative functions. Yep. And, and that's, that's model, but yet still lack of models to really do it well. So I think we'll yeah, be I think, in hearing about that. I think, Doug, those have looked like client consortium and that kind of thing. This is has to be much deeper than that. Like you have to get out your structural operating deficits, right. which means you may not be as big in some ways from a staffing perspective. You may get services elsewhere else, but you can continue to serve as many, if not more students um, and survive as an institution. But. Cool. Well, so um, that was a super interesting deep dive. I wanted to shift slightly to, um, I want to know if you learned more about leadership from good examples or bad examples. And I would love for you to talk to me about um, about some of those things you've learned from either. Yeah. So, I mean, in our own lives, I tend to think we learn more when we stumble and fall than we're having than we're hitting easy home runs um so that would be true in my own life it's obviously less painful when you can observe it in someone else's struggle <laughs> that sounds terrible but i remember being a faculty member at springfield college and i write about it in a new book that's coming out this fall but i watched the president there who i liked as a human being he was a good guy and he was trying to do good work but he he couldn't he couldn't acknowledge when he was making mistakes and he couldn't, I remember a faculty meeting, I was the president of the faculty senate. So we were talking about a no confidence vote, like no confidence votes were even more powerful than they are today perhaps. Um, and he got in front of everybody. I had this one, I thought, if you only could say to people in this moment, hey, I'm sorry, I understand now how I messed this up. Like I will work with you to fix it. He could have saved his presidency in that moment and he would have, he would come across like a human being who we all struggle and fall, um, but he didn't. And I remember saying to myself, when I mess up, I'm going to get in front of people and say so. 
Like, I don't care what the situation is. I've had to do it more than I'd like to think. So, yeah, um, I think there, there are great lessons to, to be learned by watching people's uh, leadership journeys. And sometimes you learn more from when they've start, struggled. And that's been true in my own life, um, in my own leadership here as well. In fact, it was only three years ago that we hired somebody from the outside. I needed someone to come in and take a look at an acquisition we had done. And I wanted just an objective finger in the water sense of the temperature of that. How's it go? Like I'm hearing from people involved in it, but can you just give me a sense of how it's going? And this guy came in, he did a remarkably good job. He spent weeks interviewing everybody involved and documenting things and ready to talk about it. But he said, can I get on your calendar? I need 90 minutes. It's not, it's out of scope. It's pro bono. Do with it what you will, but in 90 minutes of your time. He said, sure, absolutely. So he came in and he said all kinds of nice things about my leadership and impact of people and what they would do for me, et cetera, et cetera. I kind of went through walls, et cetera, et cetera. And then he said, but you're not creating leaders here. You're failing your people. You're failing your team. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, I've been swimming in SNHU's waters now for weeks. And the number of times I ask somebody about something and they say, either, well, it's what Paul wanted, or what does Paul want, or what well, Paul said X. He said, no one's, I know in some of those cases, they disagree with you. And I asked, what do you do? Like, well, no, Paul wants us to do this thing. And he said, you know, they have enormous trust in you, and you have track record here, and they love the mission of what you're doing, so they will simply acquiesce, but it's not good leadership. And sometimes you're wrong, from what I can tell. I was devastated. I was, you know, I grew up Catholic. I'm a bit of a lapsed Catholic mutt, religiously speaking. But I remember, you know, I said to my wife just a week before that meeting, I was like, hey, you know what? I've been doing this a long time. I think I kind of got it. Like, sorry, I know that sounds terribly immodest. Like, I think I got it. Like, these things come around the track. I'm like, I've run this lap before. I know what this is. And she said, are you kidding? You never say that. Like, don't say that. Like, you know what happens. You know, pride goes before the fall. And sure enough, a week later, I had this conversation. It just devastated me. And I said in that meeting with him, I said, you know what? I need you, I need to sort of tear up your contract, expand the scope of your work. I need you to interview everybody who works for me. Um, and then I want to get us all in a room. I don't want to preview, like just lay it out. And, and he did. And we had the toughest meeting. And he came, he came at me pretty hard in that meeting, describing in very concrete ways the things that, he, that I just told you about in broad strokes. And I could see some of my people that are like, hmm, I'll try and put it to the boss. I right? like, this is good. I like this. Um, <laughs> and then he turned to them and he said, and there's no courage in this room. There's one exception. My COO has been with me 17 years. She can, she will say hard things to me. So, and then he used examples and then you could see them like shrinking, 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 shrinking. <laughs> um, and you know, some you, you, you guys have been around long enough to have been in hard meetings and then you kind of work through it. And then at the end, you kind of have that, whew, that was bruising, but like, we didn't have that ending. We walked out of that room feeling pretty bruised and beat up and like, what the hell does this mean? Like, what does it mean for us as a team? What does it mean for us as leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And then we gathered three weeks later and spent two days really working through it. We were at a grand old hotel on the coast of New Hampshire, which doesn't have much coast, but it's called the Wentworth, Wentworth by the Sea. And uh, we call it the Wentworth Accords. And these were our commitments to each other. And we, mo we most days, we pretty much stick to them. We backslide sometimes because we're human beings. And sometimes we even weaponize it. Like when someone says, I just want to invoke the Wentworth Accords here. You're like, okay, here we go. Go ahead. Like, we're about to get it. But by and large, we don't do that. And I think it's really, we're in a much, much better place than our team. But I had to really think hard about my leadership and how I lead at this stage in my career. And it was important. So you learn them. Oftentimes, you learn the most when you can sort of knock, knock to the floor um, and what you do with that. No, I, I think that's really, that's true and um, super important to talk about because I think that topic, that, that precise point about how leaders cultivate and support people who say no around them um, is really difficult. I'm often, when I go to institutions and I'm observing, I'm always looking for who the people are that, that have um, earned the right and respectfully use the ability to say no to the president. And oftentimes I can count on, I think even at um, some of the biggest and most celebrated institutions, I know of three people 
Um, so it is very difficult to do that, but um, it's it's this issue around creating candor around you and safe, you know, environment, but yet also still leading and still being directive. And that's a it's a it's that's a needle to thread. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, Bridget. You said you know, her and the right, but in reality, everyone should start with the right. You may lose the right, <laughs> but you should. It's actually, I think, it was incumbent on me to make sure that I was letting them exercise that right. Right. So not to be impatient, to not, you know, if someone says to me, what do you think we should do about X? My longstanding tradition was to answer the question. As my wife says, you know, often wrong, but never in doubt. Like, ask me a question, I'll sort of give you an answer. And had to learn to sort of say, wait a minute, you know more about this than me. You've been studying it. What do you want to do? What do you think you want to do? And then learning to sort of bite my tongue when it's 10%, 15%, or 20% different in the way I'd like to go. Like I can ask questions that can be helpful, but not not directives pretending to be questions, like genuine questions and see if they get there. And I think it's still hard some days because I'm opinionated and I think I'm passionate about some things, but like letting people make their own mistakes and letting people try things out. And God, you know, if they're not better than me in their areas and I'm not hiring very well, like they should all be smarter than me. Like if I'm smarter than our head of HR, we're in real trouble. Right, if I'm smarter than our head of IT in real trouble. So it's really trying to learn that dance and make them a real team. Look at at the end of the day, if I when I when my time to step down comes, if this place is not functioning at a with real leadership across the board, then I've failed. Like you don't need cults of personality. You need organizations that are well led across the board. And I mean up and down, because we tend to think of this as a lot like my team. But can I give you one example where we're trying a different leadership practice after the murder of George Floyd? We set aside with the trustees uh, support $5 million on a social justice fund that had three questions we wanted to address. What do our people need in this moment, this very hard moment? So like almost like in the moment, what things can we do differently? Secondly is longer term question, what does it mean to be an employee of color at SNHU? How do we make it better? And the third question was, how do you, um, how, what does it mean to be a student of color at SNHU? What can we do better? So we dedicated, and in our old practice, I would have brought in our head of DEI and maybe an outside consultant and my team would have got together. And we would have said, you know, we didn't put out a memo saying, here's what we're doing with the money. And we would have been applauded. Like people internally love the fact that we were doing this. It felt like we were being proactive. We were addressing hard questions, et cetera, et cetera. We would have been applauded. And then they would have watched to see how it all went. We changed our practice and said, no, we're gonna do, we're gonna use a new tool that is not common to us, which is like, we're gonna do three communities of practice around each of these questions. We're going to put 20 people on each because the research tells us that's about the optimal size. We're going to train people to facilitate them because that's a certain kind of skill in art. And then the way you get on is not by your title or your place in the organization or your, where you sit in the hierarchy. You go on on the basis of two questions, that you have um, credibility among your peers. It doesn't matter where you sit, but if people say, oh, yeah, Doug, Doug talks about it. Doug has cared about this forever. And then track record. It's one thing to talk about it, but have you done anything? Have you been engaged in the work? So we had three communities of practice that were like, you couldn't tell from an org chart, how did someone get on here? It didn't matter. And it was messy and it took longer for them to come up with recommendations, but they did better work than if we had reverted to our old top-down command and control, hierarchical, higher ed leadership thing. And what was different, they own the work. And then there were multiple side benefits. They talked about how they were meeting people that they didn't know from the organization. They were forging new relationships. It was a way of being in the work that was different to them. And it just had to spill over positive. We're trying to figure out like more of those tools, more of those ways of working. Because higher ed, our institutions are, even though they're egalitarian and we have things like shared governance, they're very hierarchical. They're very siloed. They're very command and control in some ways. And I just don't think that works very well in the world in which we find ourselves today, which is changing so fast. The certainty of leaders is really suspect in my mind right now. That's great. Uh, I agree. And I, well, I do want to wrap on our two rapid fires real quick. Yeah. Number one, best advice you've ever received that has helped you in your career? Say yes. I mean, say yes. Say yes. Say yes to opportunities. Say yes to the invitation. Say yes, it's, it's in my career and my life. <laughs> Who gave that advice to you? Uh, God, it was, yeah, I, I, I'll try to shorten this really quickly. No. I took a semester off from college, almost broke my mother's heart. I was delivering heavy appliances. I went, everyone was, 
uh, had two guys on each truck. I was the driver because I'm pretty sure my partner, Jerry, had a DUI, probably multiples. So I had to pick Jerry up every day. My now wife was going off to the West Coast 3,000 miles away and broke up with me on a phone call. We had a wonderful, romantic summer. Now she's away. Like, this is impossible. Law school stressing me out. So I picked up Jerry. I said, I'm going to drop you off at work. He said, why? What are you doing? I said, well, Pat broke up with me last night. Yeah. I said, I'm going to go some, find some place to get drunk. So he goes, oh, hell, I'll go with you. So we didn't go to work. We went to, we found a Chinese restaurant that would serve us at 8 o'clock in the morning. And at the end of this, I was having an argument that only drunk men have, which is she would never break up with me if we had been face to face. Like, oh, yeah. I was like, he goes, you should go out. I was like, you know what? I will. So I got on a bus without cell, pre-cell phone days, pre-ATM, and I got on a bus and four days later, got off to campus in University of Oregon at the law school, found my wife, a longer version of this, and we've been together ever since. Um, sometimes you just say yes to the invitation. <laughs> That is a, that's a that's a, that I did not think that that story was going that that anecdote was going to lead to that. So that's great. Um, lastly, a book that you recommend about leadership or that you, you consistently you find yourself recommending more time and time again. It's funny because I don't tend to read a lot of high read books. I read a lot of other books. Um, and I think, you know, I keep I keep coming back to novels. I keep coming back to fiction. I keep coming back to try to understand sort of who we are as human beings in, in other ways. So the one that I'm reading right now is um, George Saunders' wonderful book. I think it's called Swimming in a Pool in the Rain, which is a, based on a class he teaches at Syracuse, deconstructing five Russian short stories. Um, and it's really about our humanity. And I think I'm old enough in a place in my career that I used to think it was all about our skills. And I actually think it's about our relational power now. And, and I was just talking about this with a group of young leaders we just hired, like, no, my old, my old tendency was to start every meeting with the agenda. My tendency today is like, how are you? How are you doing? Like, how are you in this moment today, right? I think that's partly a reflection of the world that we find ourselves in. I think it's the effect of the pandemic. But but if I can, again, finish just very quickly with a short story, a friend of mine from New Jersey went to work for a provost down in Texas, you know, very close to the end of her career. And my New Jersey friend who was like, full of like, eh, I'm gonna take this place on, you know? In the first meeting, she was the associate provost had the agenda in front of her. She goes, all right, everybody, great to see you this morning. Let's jump in. And one of this provost kind of tapped her on the arm and said, honey, honey, hold on for a second. Doug, Doug, how's your mama? I know she's a little sick. And she feeling any better? And I said, well, oh, she's kind of seeing a doctor. So, and Bridget, but you're a little girl. Now, you're a little girl who's going out that championship. How'd she do? Bridget, she went around the room. And everyone got grounded. And everyone was reminded that they have lives of rich human beings outside of work. And then she tapped my friend on the arm and said, honey, now we can go to work. And my friend who relates the story is like taking that extra beat. So I think, I think, uh, sorry, but I wandered from your question, but I, I read constantly and I read voraciously. So I feel, if you read High Fidelity, I'm like the guy who gets asked about which is your favorite album and the reason I can't answer that question. But George Saunders, because that's the book I'm deep, deep, deep in right now. I was just going to note for Paul that that you and Freeman Robaski was on the show six, eight months ago, maybe. And you and he gave the exact, not, not the same book, but basically the focus on fiction, which uh, I think says something because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, both leaders who who think about people as human beings. And uh, I think he, he basically said the same thing about what we really need to be focusing on is how people interact. So, anyway, I yeah, that was and, and I think, you know, as, a, as an English major in books, let allow you to inhabit the lives of people unlike yourself. So. I love Tommy Orange, for example, and trying to understand what it means to be Native American in this country. So I can't, I can't get there, but he can help me understand even more. And I think there's just so many good examples of that. You know, like, yeah. So. Um, well, this has been wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, someone also on LinkedIn just commented that uh, we heard about the Charlotte's Web being recommended from Nova's president too. So yes, this sure. uh, concept of, of fiction as a as a teacher uh, around leadership in particular, I think is is, is very important. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, President Levant. It's been a, a delight to get to know this totally other side of you. And I hope that others have been um, also uh, just expand their idea of you has expanded as well. So, um, and Doug, as always, thanks for being a great co-host and folks at home. We hope this has been inspiring and we will see you soon. Thank you both. Thank you so much.